Good morning. My name is Julie Nelson. I'm one of the assistant priests here at Christ Church in Los Altos. You'll notice that we have a new face with us this morning. My great friend, Andrew Wright, who's the canon to the ordinary in the Diocese of New Jersey is with us today, and he'll be preaching at the later service. But right now we're going to start the children's service portion of our worship. And we will begin with our opening sentence. I will say, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you will say, blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. So let's begin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Good morning, friends. Today's children's song is Sia Hamba a wonderful hymn and freedom song from South Africa that I think you all know very well by now. So we'll sing one verse in English, one verse in Spanish, and one verse in Hosa. So please feel free to march along. Unfortunately, I can't march and play the piano at once, so I will let uh, Julie lead that for us. gospel story, we hear about Jesus and his disciples out on this big field with about 5,000 people. And these people, this crowd has been following Jesus around because they've heard about all the healing that he's done, and they've heard that he feeds people, and people are hungry. So they come and they gather all around Jesus. And so Jesus says to the disciples, hey, it's about dinner time what are you guys going to feed these people? And the disciples are like, what are you talking about? There's 5,000 people here. Like, how are we going to buy food for all these people? And one of the disciples says, you know, there's a young boy here, and he has five loaves of bread and two fish. So that's what we got. And Jesus says, that's great. Why don't you start distributing that to the people? So Jesus blesses the bread, blesses the fish, blesses the food, and sends the disciples out to start sharing this little bit of food they have with 5,000 people. And after everybody's been given food and everybody's had as much to eat as they can, Jesus says, why don't you go collect the leftover food? And so the disciples go out with these big, big baskets, big job baskets, big baskets, and they collect 12 baskets of leftover food. When what they started with was five loaves of bread and two fish. And that's pretty outrageous. And so I was thinking about this, you know, this is kind of a well-known miracle story. 
But if I was thinking about it a little bit differently this week, thinking about what if when the disciples started to share this little bit of food they had, I wonder if other people had food with them too. Like if they had bags or knapsacks or something where they had brought their own food. And as soon as the disciples started to share food, other people took food out of their bags and started to share food too. That because the disciples were showing what it looked like to share food, other people were more willing to share their food. And I was thinking about how like this happens to us sometimes at the lunch table. Like, you know, when you're at school and you're having lunch and somebody says, hey, can I have some of your chips? And somebody else says, sure, you can have some of my chips. And then someone else at the table says, does anybody want one of my cookies? And pretty soon you're all like sharing your food, right? Because somebody was willing to share, everybody else is willing to share a little bit too. But the opposite can be true sometimes at lunch, right? When somebody says, can I have some of your chips? And that person says, no, you can't have any of my chips. And then nobody else wants to share either, right? Then pretty soon everybody's just keeping all their own stuff to themselves. And so we're thinking about this story of Jesus and the miracle and all of this food. And we're thinking about what we, what happens when we create a culture of sharing, what happens when we share and other people share, that what we end up with is way more than what we might have had if we just kept our things to ourselves. That God's generosity multiplies in the midst of us when we are also being generous. And that really cool things can happen in the world when we're willing to share and we're willing to partner with Jesus and with God to give to other people what we have. So that's what I was thinking about when I thought about this little boy who shared his five loaves of bread and his two fish and how it became enough food for 5,000 people and 12 extra baskets. But I'm sharing. That's what I have to say about our gospel today. Very good. Okay, now it's time for a prayer. So here we go. Everybody, fingers, get your fingers ready. Everybody get the fingers, wake up. Pick up the fingers, get, the, get everything going here because we're going to need these hands to be really alive when we put them on our heart. Okay. Take a deep breath and relax for just a moment. Ah, gracious and loving God. You shared your son with us. He shared his life with us. He shared his love with us. Your love and his love has been shared with us in ways which we cannot even imagine. And you call us to do the same with one another. Help us to always remember how important it is to share everything that Jesus taught us to share and how when we do that, we're loving you. In your name we pray, amen. I'll invite you to join us now in our closing song, Go Now in Peace. all so much for joining us for the children's portion of our service this morning. If you have to go now, we do hope that you go in peace, but we really hope that you'll stay and worship with us at our service of Holy Eucharist. And our prelude will start in just a moment, so just hang on the line.
Good morning. My name is Julie Nelson. I'm one of the assisting priests here at Christ Church in Los Altos. We're so happy that you've joined us for worship this morning, either live in, on, in person on Zoom with us or later on YouTube. If you'd like to know more about us and how we're staying connected, please visit our website at ccla.us. You'll notice a new face joining us today. My friend Andrew Wright is here as our guest preacher, so please Warmly welcome him with a little wave and a smile. We're so glad that he's here with us today. Um, and now let us take a deep breath and prepare ourselves for worship. Our opening hymn this morning is, O oh Love, How Deep, How Broad, How High. I'm 
and actions thus still seeking not himself but us for us to Blessed be the one, holy, and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Together, almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. May God be with you. Thank you. Let us pray. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy. Increase and multiply upon us your mercy that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not the things eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the second book of Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings went out to do battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. 
the woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she was sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent David, sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house. David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for this morning is Psalm 14. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. All are corrupt and commit abominable acts. There is none who does any good. The Lord looks down from heaven upon us all to see if there is any who is wise, if there is one who seeks after God. Everyone has proved faithless, all alike have turned bad. There is none who does good, no, not one. Have they no knowledge, all those evildoers, who eat up my people like bread and do not call upon the Lord? See how they tremble with fear because God is in the company of the righteous. Their aim is to confound the plans of the afflicted. But the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that Israel's deliverance would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice and Israel be glad. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. 
I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months wages would not buy, buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, and so also the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 
12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this, indeed, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force and make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because of a strong wind, strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat re reached the land to toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, good morning, everyone. As Julie said at the beginning, my name is Andrew Wright, and I'm so pleased to be with you all uh, from the other side of the continent uh, today. I'm over here in uh, New Jersey. It's actually the Diocese of Newark. There's two dioceses in the state of New Jersey, and Newark is the northern third of the diocese, including, obviously, the city of Newark. Um, and so um, it has a very significant kind of New York metropolitan feel to about half the diocese, and then the rest is kind of rural wilderness where bears roam around, and it's all trees and, you know, green and um, it's very interesting diversity in the diocese in lots of ways and i serve as canon to the ordinary which is uh, you know so effectively i assist the bishop of newark in whatever she wants to do <laughs> it's really what i do it's uh, we we love our kind of archaic titles and uh, in that title the canon to the ordinary canon is in this case just a, a church official um, a diocesan official and the ordinary refers to the bishop. Uh, that's one of the ways that we talk about the diocesan bishop is the ordinary, not in the sense of being plain or mundane, but rather the one who kind of organizes the system like an ordinal member. And so we have this kind of wonderfully quaint uh, title that I always have to sort of explain whenever it comes up. So there you go. There's your trivia for the day. Maybe we'll come up on a crossword puzzle. Who knows? Um, but I'm very glad to be with you all. I'm very thankful for the invitation uh, from Julie. And for the peculiar blessing of these times where I am able to uh, be with you all and share with you, um, you know, the sermon from from afar. Um, and so um, a joy to get to know you all in this mediated way. Our, our lessons today are all over the map, quite honestly. I mean, we have, you know, kind of the book of Samuel's attempts at a telenovela with David just completely going off the rails. We have kind of a wonderful, poignant uh, scripture from Ephesians, uh, which I think is one that we might want to just spend some time reflecting on and praying over, honestly, rather than preaching over. And then we have, um, you know, not one, but kind of two miraculous events in the Gospel of John. And John is always over the top in lots of ways. And we've been reading Mark, so it's a little bit startling to, you know, hear John at this point in the year. So that's just an awful lot. We're not going to talk about all of that, just to let you know. And honestly, on the surface of it, if I could choose between, um, you know, dealing with all of David's uh, sort of incredible um, and sort of disgusting um, deficiencies, or talking about Jesus' picnic, you know, out on uh, the, the lawn, um, I would much rather talk about Jesus' picnic. But we have all the lessons, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of them, and there's always more to talk about. But there's a lot here is all I'm saying. But let's talk a little bit first about this um, feeding of the 5,000. It's such a great story and it's so familiar to us in so many ways. It's, it's iconic for us. You know, it is a sign of God's abundance. It is a sign of, of Jesus' care um, and compassion for the community that, that he's building and gathering around him. It has lots of symbolic layers to it as well, of course. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously, you know, coming from this kind of a, a reference to communion itself, uh, John's Gospel doesn't really have the Last Supper per se. They gather, but they don't actually eat anything uh, very obviously in John's Gospel. Jesus talks a lot the night before he dies, but there's no real food served. Um, and so we have these other stories in John that get at the ideas that are related to communion, like the thing of the 5,000 or the true vine um, teaching that Jesus has. And so it's even incorporated in um, art. Hopefully we'll be able to see this fine. So this is, we'll see, I've got my background there now. Okay, let's see, there we go. So this is a patent from the Middle East. It's, it's not expensive or fancy. This is everywhere in certain countries. 
it's like tourist, you know, snow globes kind of a thing. But it's a patent, and I have a child that goes with it. And it's a um, an image of an ancient mosaic. This is just simply, you know, a laminated image. But it's of obviously the loaf of bread in the barley loaves in the basket and the two fish, right? And so, you know, this comes from a mosaic. There's a chalice too. Get the right depth. There we go. Almost there we go. There's a chalice as well. And um, and I use it for my personal communion set when I go to visit the sick. It was given to me by a priest I worked for a long time ago. And, you know, it's, it's, it's the right size for that. And I love the imagery on it. Like I said, it comes from an ancient mosaic. And that tells us something about the power of this lesson in terms of how it communicates Jesus feeding his people. And of course, for us in, in communion, it's Jesus feeding his people with his very self in this very powerful sacramental way. And so the feeding of the 5,000 is John's way of kind of foreshadowing that to some degree or, or trying to teach about that um, to some degree. And so that's part of the layers we have going on here. And I bring that up partly because with this peculiar phrase in the psalm, you didn't know I was going to the psalm. That's the surprise twist. In the psalm, we have this line where it says, have they no knowledge, all these evildoers who eat up my people like bread and do not call upon the Lord? What an interesting line to put in conversation with this passage from John. I don't know that that was intentional on the lectionary framers point of view. We have no idea what the lectionary people think. They're, it's always very confusing to preachers how the lectionary kind of got where it is. But that's evocative, isn't it? These evildoers who eat up many people like bread. And so it's this kind of reversal of the feeding of the 5,000 where it's the people who are being consumed by those who are doing evil. And yet, when we think about our context of, of gathering for Holy Eucharist, where we, in a sense, consume the sacramental body of Jesus for, for the good of our community, for the good of the world, in fact, because of the empowerment that we receive from Jesus, especially in that meal. But there's just a very interesting complex play of symbols going on here. And in this Psalm, when it says, have they no knowledge all these evildoers eat, eat it by people like bread, the evildoers that the Psalm is referring to is, is referenced just before it. It's, it's everybody. Everyone has proved faithless. You know, all are corrupt and commit abominable acts. This psalm is incredibly depressing in certain ways when you start off with it, because it starts off saying, all are corrupt and commit abominable acts. There is none who does any good. This was a very bad day for the psalmist. You can tell that they had just had it to hear with everybody. The Lord looks down to see if there's any who is wise, if any seeks after God, which is implying that no one is. Everyone is faithless. All have turned to bad. There's no one who does good, not one. And then this line about consuming the people like bread. When, when the people become that which fuels and you know, sustains those who are evil, there's something very wrong in a community. There's an exploitation that is implied there. There is this kind of awful um, you know, using up of people. And that's not just, of course, the ancient world. Right? We see that in our world today, sadly, all the time that those who are on the margins in particular are exploited and consumed and used up by those who have power and use that power for evil. And honestly, there's almost too many examples to, um, to go into. I think we all probably can think of times that we've seen something like that happen. And not just now, I mean, throughout history, this is a human nature problem, right? Especially when we receive power we often do not do well with that, whether it's us as just human beings or us as the church. We can look at the history of the church as well, and there are plenty of times that the church has consumed its people and used them up and exploited them. That's not the way that God sees the world. That's not the way God wants us to be in the world. That is not the world that God has created. It is what we as God's willful creation have done to the world. And that gets us to David right there, doesn't it? So this story is really a very concise pericope of David's kind of, you know, most dreadful acts, 
at least as far as scripture tells us. Actually, David had a lot of problematic things that he did. Um, and he's a very um, complex person because he's lifted up as definitely a leader in the Hebrew scriptures. Some places even written about heroically and someone who, you know, yearned after God's own heart was beloved of God. And then we get a story like this, which is even more awful once you start unpacking it than it seems on the surface. The surface is bad enough. Like what is just, you know, evident right here is, is dreadful. You know, David seeing someone bathing wants to entice them, exploit them, consume them without a care for who they are or who they're married to. And then when he gets in trouble, he does a, a, a cover up or tries to. His cover up fails completely because Uriah has more honor than David does. And then he resorts to engineering Uriah's death. But even in this story, there's, there's layers here. And, and David is depicted here as a terrible king. The kings of Israel, there were not a whole lot that were great in terms of how the story is told in scripture anyway. But they had kind of, you know, not just one job. They did have two jobs. Their jobs were to read Torah, to read the whole Hebrew scriptures, and to lead, when necessary, the nation in battle. And so you see here, when battle season comes up, all the other kings go out for battle season, out to the field. David does not. He stays home. Now, we don't know why. But he's not home reading the Torah, I can tell you that, because of what he gets into. If he, if he read the Torah and didn't get up on the rooftop being you know, a peeping Tom or peeping David, we also wouldn't get into the trouble that we get into in this story. But he doesn't do either of the things he's supposed to do as king. So he's failing as king completely. He's you know, abdicating his role. And he sends others to do the fighting for him, Joab and his mighty men. It was a very testosterone-filled era, you can tell from the story. His, his A-team, they're the mighty men of David. It's not even a cool name like the Avengers or the Justice League or something like that. No, no, the mighty men. Anyway, they gird up their loins, literally, and go out and fight. David's at home. He sees Bathsheba. He likes what he sees. He summons her. And of course, realize her agency in the story is virtually non-existent. It is non-existent. We get one line from Bathsheba. Y'all notice the one thing that she says in this whole story? I am pregnant. That's what she gets to say. And in fact, even in the story where she is marginalized, she is consumed and eaten up, in a way, the story focuses so much more on Uriah and David it almost leaves her out. I think it would leave her out if it could. And that's one of the things we have to pay attention to in how these stories are told, is that really the person whose story this should be is almost excluded entirely. So even in the telling of the story, there is this kind of consumption of someone and, and pushing them aside. So he has a tryst with her. It's also against Torah for them to have had a tryst when they had that, because this is why it gets into her, her menstrual cycle, that she just had her period. It's why it says that, because you weren't supposed to have an encounter with anyone for that, that week, even her husband. So David is breaking the law in every possible way. So it's, like I said, it's just even more despicable than it looks like on the surface. And then he brings in Uriah, who, by the way, Uriah is not an Israelite. Is not bound by the law and is shown to be a much more honorable man than David. He's a Hittite. It's a whole different people group. But he shows up and he has such honor and such kind of regard for the troops and his commanding officer that he won't go home and, you know, create this cover up that David wanted to create. Unfortunately, that seals his fate because David is so determined to go forward with this that the end of this passage ends with Uriah returning to battle, carrying his own death warrant. Orders to be put into the fiercest part of the battle and then have the troops draw back so that Uriah will be destroyed. That's David's solution. David is consuming people like bread. All the more ironic since the Psalms are attributed to David. I don't know whether our Psalm today was written by David or not, but but he certainly fulfills that verse. And so what do we make of this on a Sunday morning? 
what do we have? You know, <laughs> good news. There's the story of David, and there's more to the story. You know, you'll get the rest of the story next week if it's the same track um, of the comeuppance and the repentance that occurs. But right now, this is what we have. It's a disaster. It's a mess. We have enough messes in the world. We don't need to hear about ancient messes, right? And yet there is good news in this. And that good news is even when we reach our absolute depths, even when there is no one among us who does any good, David for sure included, God is faithful. God is our refuge. And God is a refuge first for those who are consumed, for those who are marginalized, for those who are exploited. But God also seeks to call back those who have gone awry, seeks to bring back into the fold those who have been so willful as to destroy and consume people in their path. The good news is that none of us are beyond redemption. It never excuses what someone does. It's something like the story with David, for example. But God is so faithful that even someone who's deplorable may be redeemed. God reaches beyond any sense that we have of retribution and seeks a deeper relationship with all of humanity. And that is good news indeed. Most of us will not quite go off the rails like David did, I hope. I pray to God for all of us. But there are small ways that I go off the rails, and perhaps you do too. There are times when my better nature is not on the surface. And I might hold grudges and be bitter. And I might undermine others. There are times when I'm sure I do exploit and even consume others in some way, if I'm being honest. And perhaps there are times in your life that that's happened. And there are plenty of times when people have received God's grace and mercy without deserving it at all. And isn't that really the heart of what we're talking about? But there's the things that we choose to do, and we can choose to be part of what God is doing in this world and move that forward. Or we can choose to move in a different direction and harm and, and, and cause all kinds of trouble for people. God continues to move forward and calls us back into that movement all the time. And it's not without cost. You know, there's the cost of repentance. There's the cost of you know, amendment of life. To, to truly come back into God's path requires action and sacrifice. It's not an easy pass, but it is an invitation. And so in our message today, in this scripture and, and in the others as well, even in our gospel reading to some degree, it's, it's more nuanced perhaps, there is a, kind of a double message. One is to those who are on the margins, to those who have been exploited, to have been consumed, that little boy whose lunch was taken away from him to feed 5,000 people, for example, or to Bathsheba, who was so abused and then almost written out of her own story. To all of those and more, God says, I will restore. I will heal. I will bring justice. But to those who cause those problems, to those who exploit, to those who consume, God invites to return. And that is a huge blessing. Because even though we may not be epically dreadful like David was in the story, there are things that we let get in the way between us and God. And sometimes we hang on to that because we're afraid of what to do with it. And that's an important thing to realize as well, that, that we have a role to respond to God's call. When we have something between us and God to deal with that, to repent, to remove it, to move on. You all have these astonishing windows that are in the backgrounds of a couple of folks on this call right now. And I've seen some of the pictures of them. And I know that that's one of the like distinctive features of your church space. And you know, I read through some of the information on your website and saw how important a symbol that was, you know, when that part of the church was designed and, and what it communicated about who you are. And I love the idea of us as windows of God's light shining through. 
And there are times when, you know, our windows get dirty, quite literally, that we, we, we add things in our life that get in the way of God's light. Usually things like anger and pride and bitterness and resentment. But it could be other things too. And part of our task is to know how to clean that off with God's help, how to help each other see when there's something in the way and help each other clean that off so that God's light can shine through. The beauty of the image of the windows is that it's the particulars of our life, just like the particulars of those windows in terms of the colors and the patterns that make it so beautiful. I mean, a clear plate glass window itself is kind of a stunning accomplishment. But the intricacy of the patterns of stained glass windows is just so beautiful to behold. And that's how it is, I think, how God looks at us. The intricacies of our lives, all the things that are distinctive about us, some that we like, some that we don't, but nonetheless distinctive about each of us, makes a unique contribution to God's light shining in this world. We've got to keep the light shining. We have to keep the path moving forward, the abundance being shared and you know, rejoiced in, to find those times when we are able to receive what God has given us in order to feed the world rather than consume the world. I'm so thankful to be with you all today and to share in these fascinating readings. And I hope that, you know, our, um, I won't say conversation, I guess, because it's kind of one-sided, but I hope that our uh, you know, exploration of these scriptures has been interesting. And I'm really thankful um, to know that your faithful work continues and the light is shining through in your community. God bless.
We pray for all people who know you and seek you. Send down, Send down your, your spirit, Lord, Lord, and fire, fire us, us with, your, with love. your love. We pray for the world and all who work for justice and peace. Send down your spirit, Lord, and transform us with your hope. We pray for all creation and every living thing. Send down your spirit, Lord, and fill us with your grace. We pray for the lost, the forgotten, and those in any kind of need. Send down your spirit, Lord, and comfort us with your light. We pray for those who have died and those who grieve. Send down your spirit, Lord, and turn our mourning into dancing. We pray for the special needs and concerns of this congregation. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Scottish Episcopal Church. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. James Fremont, St. James San Francisco, Santiago St. James Oakland, and St. Anne's Fremont. We pray in thanksgiving for our parish school, Ventana. We pray for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and those in any trouble. Gloria Wing, Hadley, Jackie, Jean, Rick, Azure, Naya, Seraphine, Jen Barry, Ginger, Shelley Wagner, Dick Quigley, Meredith Parkinson, Tom Fortzheimer, John, Valerie Peterson, Ann Crane, Ian, Cheryl Matthews, Miguel Margarejo, Lisa Caldagan, Mark, Peggy, Mark and Nadine Turner. We pray for the safety of healthcare providers everywhere, especially Bob Boyer and his wife, Renee, Ken Carlisle, Connie Highstand and Alex Hawkins. We pray for all those affected by COVID-19 and all those struggling with anxiety, depression and isolation. We pray for those who have entered eternal life and those who mourn them, especially Elizabeth Chamberlain. We give thanks for answered prayers. I invite your own prayers of thanksgiving or intercession, either spoken aloud or in the silence of your heart. Creator God and giver of life, pour out your spirit upon the whole creation. Come in rushing wind and flashing fire and courage and inspiration to turn the sin and sorrow within us into faith, power, and delight for your love's sake. Amen. Let us confess our sins that we may receive God's grace. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. I invite you now to temporarily unmute yourselves so that we may all pass the peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Also, also with you. Also with you. Peace. Peace. Also with you. Peace, everybody. Peace, everybody. Peace, everyone. Peace. I'll invite you to remute yourselves when you are ready. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you for your good news this morning. Um, I have a couple of announcements. This Wednesday, the men's group is meeting um, online via Zoom. So you'll find that link in the weekly newsletter if you'd like to join them. And um, I've said this before, but I'll just remind you again that Joe Bishop's funeral is going to be on August 14th at four o'clock in the afternoon um, here at the church. And then the, his family's hosting a barbecue on the lower lawn after and everyone is welcome to join them. Um, and then we have a couple of birthdays today in the bulletin we have Randy Wild, and then Eric Tuan also had a birthday this week, which I did not know. So that's very exciting. So we will pray together. Watch over your children, O oh, oh Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, which passes all understanding, Abide all the days of their life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday, y'all. All right. And then we also have an anniversary. Dennis and Marie Hawkins. Where are you guys? I don't see you. Here? Hmm. There, there. Hey there. There you are. All right. Well, let's pray for you both. Oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon these your servants, Dennis and Marie, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Thank you. 
All things come of thee, O Lord. And of your own have we given you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. In fulfillment of his true promise, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, uniting peoples of many tongues in the confession of one faith and giving to your church the power to serve you as a royal priesthood and to preach the gospel to all nations. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your son. For in these last days, you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the savior and redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. And the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, We remember his death. We proclaim his resurrection. We await his coming in glory. 
And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection unto your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country where with all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our honor and glory as yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. are the gift of God for the people of God, holy food for holy people. Let us pray. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, we desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming in glory. Since we cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us, in this life and in the life to come. Amen.
May God give you the grace to never sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. And grace to remember that the world is now too dangerous for anything but the truth and too small for anything but love. May the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia.